good evening and Shavua Tov uh, to all of my fellow Turvs and Jewish brothers and sisters and uh, anyone else who likes to fuck around on my channel. Uh, thank you for being here. Don't forget to like and subscribe and comment and um, share as much as you can, you know. I um, would like to shout out Brittany at uh, Slightly Twisted Female for boosting my channel uh, last week. That was so awesome because I'm such a fan of her content um, and it, it, I got a lot of followers out of that. So thanks, Brittany. <laughs> um, and so tonight, what I really wanted to do is talk about somebody that I mentioned in one of my gorgeous bloke videos, um, Magnus Hirschfeld, the uh, gay Jewish... Uh, sexologist uh, whose institute of sex research was uh, burned down by the Nazis. Queer academia has done a magnificent job of rewriting history um, or doing that communist thing of presenting um, lies with a truth to it. Um, is it true that Magnus Hirschfeld uh, was Jewish? Yes, of course. Is it true that he was a homosexual? Yes, although he never publicly talked about it, uh, nor did he ever uh, publicly label himself as such. Um, you know, although we all knew, you know, Fagala, like, <laughs> you know, uh, <laughs> and he was doing sex research. These are true things. Um, was he a pioneer of gay rights? Uh, I would argue no, although he may have campaigned for the rights of homosexuals not to be uh, discriminated against. That's one good idea he had out of a plethora of horrible ideas he had, including eugenicist, uh, racist, uh, uh, crackpot science. And uh, it really grinds my gears to see him valorized, not just by people on the left, but but Jews on the left, <laughs> you know, it's like, uh, it's kind of like how the ADL spent all this time uh, worrying so much about, uh, you know, some alt-right boogeyman that then the anti-Semitic, uh, you know, left brewing up whatever is going on right now got to do everything all willy-nilly and uh, no one's, no one saw it coming until I guess this last pogrom enacted by Hamas, uh, although Jews who maybe had their eyes opened a lot earlier <laughs> noticed far before that that the left fucking hates us. So um, this video is not only to dispel uh, myths about Magnus Hirschfeld um, just as a, as a person and, and his place within the context of the Weimar Republic, uh, and then moving into the Third Reich, uh, but to also dispel misinformation that has proliferated uh, due to lefty Jews wanting to be accepted uh, by the wokey dokes, which of course is never going to happen because all of the uh, intersectional, uh, you know, queer, critical race theology, whatever, is designed inherently to exclude Jews. But nevertheless, they tried very hard to make uh, the Talmud, for example, seem so trans-inclusive. So um, I don't know if I'll get to every point that I wanted to make in this video tonight, but I did want to start harping in on some of these topics that have been pissing me off for the past, I don't know how, how long. If you're new to my channel, um, I am uh, a de-sister from the, the trans movement, uh, the cult. Let's be honest here, it is a cult. I was indoctrinated through uh, being a member of the drag community in Los Angeles. Uh, and through the conversion process uh, into uh, becoming a member of the Jewish nation, uh, I was able to wake the fuck up and realize what a bunch of bullshit <laughs> I had been endorsing for as long as I have been. And, and uh, you know, if anybody wants to, uh, you know, uh, fight me on my Jewish cred <laughs> uh, or say I'm not a real Jew because I'm not ethnically Jewish, uh, that's one, stupid uh, and ignorant. Two, uh, if you want to see the results... <laughs> The blood work came in and I'm 2% Ashkenaz and Sephardic. So whatever. If that's still not good enough for you, I don't fucking care. <laughs> 
my channel, my rules, and my personal understanding of Judaism. My gateway, I guess, into Judaism was as the reform movement, as most of my friends and my family members who are Jewish uh, are from the reform uh, segment of the Jewish population. Um, thankfully, I was exposed to conservative Judaism um, during that process as I was attending a reform slash conservative shul because there were so few Jews in the area that uh, they combined the reform and conservative into to one synagogue. Um, and I was a, <laughs> I was a way too intimidated to go to Chabad at that point. So <laughs> listen, I love the Chabadniks, but uh, sometimes I feel like, uh, what the fuck is going on in here on this day? <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> like, uh, I, I, I never feel Jewy enough even, but that's a, that's a me problem. That's a me problem. Um, recently, I've sort of moved away from conservative Judaism, however, um, as I was uh, introduced to a couple of books by my friend Juana Trian, a wonderful, wonderful lady, um, called Eliminating the Opiate, um, or it's, is it Eliminate? It's either Eliminating or Eliminate the Opiate. I'll, I'll link it in the uh, description. Um, but it talks about how the reform and conservative movements um, are, are really like, whew, like a lot of people don't particularly understand um, the roots of those movements and how it is an attempt from the inside to remove sort of the mysticism and the the uh the the spirituality almost out of judaism um and this is not to denigrate any jew who is reform or conservative i i love the conservative movement i love conservative services um but when i was doing torah study with Juana, we discovered that the Etz Chaim um, Humash, the copy of the Torah that is used in the conservative movement in America, um, had wildly different translations and interpretations of the biblical canon that I found to be quite disturbing because um, it felt like I wasn't getting the, the real story, you know, and I feel like that's that does a disservice to Jews. Um, I know because of more distasteful parts of uh, Torah, uh, such as, you know, Leviticus 18.22, which is something I also might want to explore in this video. If I don't get to it, I have a whole spiel on that as well. Um, that because of that, it, Tanakh is something to maybe be embarrassed by almost, or, or, or it needs to be made more palatable to, um, you know, whichever majority religion um is is being practiced uh, within the society that jews live um so you know that has made me really it's really made me reconsider uh the things that i was taught when i was brought into the conversion process and um uh also make me reconsider what kind of what kind of jew i I identify as, and I hate the word identify. I'm a Jew. A Jew is a Jew is a Jew is a Jew. Uh, I don't know if I'm ever going to go through with a full Orthodox conversion, although it is something that I am interested in. And, um, you know, I, I do have tattoos all over my body <laughs> and I always feel a little, uh, self-conscious about that. Um, uh, especially because there is a prohibition of tattooing within the, uh, within Torah, I believe also in Leviticus. Um, and, you know, I sort of, under the supervision of my reform rabbi at the time, sort of flagrantly disregarded that commandment um, and, uh, and got a tattoo with the Hebrew word. And I got a little um, Mag and David tattooed on my ankle. And I figured, like, I'm already covered in tattoos. So, like, whatever. Um, but, you know, looking back on it, I might not have made that that choice if I was give any more accurate um, or more authentic uh, teaching of of Jewish practice and Jewish law. And again, this is not, this, I don't judge any other Jew that has a tattoo. Um, there's nothing that forbids us from being buried in Jewish cemeteries because of that. That That's one thing that's definitely like, that's Mishigas. You don't pay attention to that. That's not true. But, you know, it's just, it, it's like a, you know, proof of flagrant disregard of a commandment. Um, and, and, uh, you know, that just, I guess as somebody who came into it instead of being born into it, um, that's something that I maybe 
kind of self-flagellate myself over a little bit too much. <laughs> but regardless, I've started going to uh, to Orthodox services and um, I really, really fell in love with with that. I don't know what to call it, that Moshiach energy, you know, I, going to an Orthodox service. It was the first time that, you know, I. I felt comfortable voicing some of my opinions, uh, especially in, in regards to politics um, and, you know, trune, trunery, transgender nonsense, all of that stuff. But also it was nice to be around people who say things like, well, you know, it feels like Moshiach is is gearing up to, to arrive, you know, and not be thought of as totally crazy. Um, uh, and if for you, those who aren't aware of, of Moshiach, that is the, um, the Jewish prophecy of the Messiah coming, um, and establishing, reestablishing the temple, um, in Eretz Israel. And, um, you know, it's, it's really, it is pretty central to the belief system. And I have found that, uh, in conservative and especially reform, that part of, of Jewish life is, almost like dunked on, you know, <laughs> like, like it's, it's treated as something that is totally impossible or juvenile almost, you know, like it's like, oh, well, that would never really happen. But, but what I've discovered throughout the process of being naturalized into the Jewish tribe um, is that one Tanakh is not always so literal. Um, uh, Moshiach can mean different things to different people, you know, whether or not it's a literal, you know, guy showing up to save the day. There's that aspect of it. For me, it's more of a, um, I like to quote Modi Rosenfeld. Uh, he's a comedian. I like that Moshiach energy, you know, that idea that like, if we create the environment that is worthy of Moshiach, whether or not he literally arrives and we know it, or perhaps we're not supposed to know who he is. You know, there's either way, it's on us as, uh, as the people of, of Israel to create an environment in which there's balance in the world, you know, because when we have that balance, um, you know, that, that makes it so that we can have Moshiach finally reveal himself. <laughs> so that's all long winded to say that I, I, whether or not it, you want to take it so fucking literal, I do think that the prophecy of Moshiach is really uh, central to, to Judaism. Um, and it kind of makes me sad that it gets treated as like, you know, this sort of afterthought in reform and conservative Judaism, you know, reform is, ugh, God, they put so much emphasis on tikkun olam, which is repairing the world. And they, they do that through social justice. Um, and, and that's how I think a lot of, uh, progressive lefty liberal, whatever Jews have gotten so hoodwinked by, you know, DEI and ESG and all the woke stuff, because they're so focused on tikkun olam. Uh, and I don't even really have the same kind of interpretation of tikkun olam as, as reform Jews do. Um, uh, for me, tikkun olam is more about repairing the, the self and the Jewish world and, and the Jewish people, uh, prioritize, prioritizing that before, you know, whatever goisha nonsense, um, you know, people, you know, like at the ADL have been fucking doing for the past however, 10, 10 years, whenever they got super woke, um, uh, so, you know, that's just, this is all long winded rambling. I haven't even gotten to Magnus Hirschfeld, but that's the problem. The problem, it goes so far back in terms of like the way the university system has been completely overtaken by Marxists. Um, you know, whether or not the idea of Magnus Hirschfeld being some gay pioneer for, you know, homo rights, uh, whether or not that that's relatively a new thing that was added to the conversation, um, it's it's still rooted in the much longer um, um, con of creating an environment in which we're, <laughs> 
very close to societal collapse in, in the West and, uh, you know, turning uh, into some sort of CCP, WEF, uh, stakeholder capitalist, you know, fascist, communo uh, uh, dystopia. Um, so, you know, I, I, I guess I feel like I have to preface even getting into it with just all of all of the uh, context that like this is just it's another op you know it's another uh it's another way to eliminate the opiate you know from within and the fact that so many jews got pulled into promoting this kind of stuff um it's frustrating <laughs> you know it is um there's a a woman on instagram that i used to follow when i was on the app um called Roots Metals, and she is an incredible historian. Um, I, I go to her website often to find, you know, all of the historical references with regards to the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, um, just the, the Arab-Israeli conflict in, you know, pre-1948, and uh, accurate timelines. Um, and, and she does her due diligence, too. She checks, um, she uses primary sources and reads sources that negate her perception of, of what uh, a certain event was just to see the other side of it to to get to the truth um but <laughs> she's so lefty that she doesn't apply that standard to people who want to peddle bullshit like magnus hirschfeld was this fucking great ass dude and the talmud um explicitly states that trans nonsense is a-okay um that's what gets me annoyed it's it's the hypocrisy and it's the inability inability to perceive the truth uh uh absent of ideology so let's start with let's start with magnus hirschfeld there's a great article by donovan cleckley at the distance um about how transgender uh historians <laughs> Uh, have sort of um, given uh, Magnus Hirschfeld the Marsha P. Johnson treatment, uh, which is basically uh, <laughs> when they took a, a gay black drag queen who was a drugged out mess uh, and uh, made him, you know, the first trans woman to fucking save the gays at Stonewall. Whatever. It's just, it's all a bunch of bullshit. Um, the Marsha P. Johnson thing has been de debunked a million times, and yet people still believe it. However, I haven't really seen any videos about debunking Magnus Hirschfeld on YouTube. Um, I've only really just seen this piece from Donovan and then um, also a, uh, a piece by Fred Sargent that's linked in this. And I will put both of those links in the description. But let's start with Irvin Gorbrandt. Um, he's a surgeon that worked at uh, uh, Magnus Hirschfeld's uh, sex, sex Institute. And he was the go-to uh, at the Sex Institute for, you know, castrations. Um, you can see right here, castration on uh, Durchen Richter. Oh, and he did the castration and penectomy on Lily Elvinus, whatever, LB, the Danish girl, man, boy, girl, lady, boy. <laughs> um, and uh, I mentioned this in, in my other video that he went on to continue doing experiments at Dachau uh, and look at this. He was awarded Knight's Cross on uh, Hitler's personal authority. Oh, and lovely. After the war, he retired in 1958 and died a wealthy, respected citizen. That, you know, uh, let's put a, 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 a pin in this real quick. Something that uh, bothered me in 2019, before I was officially a Jew, and still bothers me to this day, is when that fucking uh, no-knowledge asshole Taika Waititi won a screenplay writing uh, a Academy Award for the worst fucking movie I'd seen that year, Jojo Rabbit. Horrible, bullshit movie. And in the press room, he's like, oh, I remember when we used to uh, send Nazis to jail. And it's like, homie, <laughs> most of the Nazis did not go to fucking jail after the, the trials. Like most of them just retired. They fled to Argentina or Brazil, or they just went to the countryside and fucking chilled in peace. Like, come on, man. Whatever. Fuck that guy. I can't stand him. <sighs> Anyways, um, 
Yeah, Mag- so here Donovan said Magnus founded the clinic. And again, Gerblons became a high-ranking Nazi doctor. So, you know, that's that's a really great guy that Jews should be promoting as, as a, you know, pioneer guy who works, eugenicist who works with fucking Nazis. <laughs> oh, here's that fucking, that AGP. <laughs> the, like, one of the conservative, uh, uh, you know, true transsexuals that was in the conservative versus liberal trans debate, whatever, being like, Oh, fun fact, the first trans surgery was performed on Lily Elby. No one had major issues with us until TRA started medicalizing kids, et cetera, et cetera. And it's like, nope, wrong again. It was actually Durchen Richter by Erwin Gorbrandt. You know, people had problems with all that stuff before the medicalization of children. So, you know, another uh, another um, <clears throat> wonderful instance of of true trans showing their asses, you know? Uh, so let's see, here's a great example right here. Donovan pointed out, um, of, of people who, you know, started writing things like, Oh, Nazi Germany persecuted transgender people. And going back to that broad roots medals, I remember her posting about some like, Oh, this, this Jewish transgender woman survived the Holocaust and blah, blah, blah. And it's like, yeah, cool. Um, so he was not, he was not, uh, persecuted for being trans. Okay. <laughs> like he was persecuted because he was a Jew. Uh, so, so let's, let's get that shit straight. Um, and if you wanted to, you can look it up on, on Wikipedia. Um, I don't really feel like I need to link it. Um, because if, if the communists haven't gotten around to, you know, re-editing the, uh, the transsexual passes of Weimar Germany, I, I don't think they will. And, and if they do, fucking, we got a uh, way back machine. So anyways, uh, during Weimar Germany, uh, uh transsexuals, uh, were given something called a transsexual pass or transsexual certificate, kind of like um, gender recognition recognition certificates in Scotland, kind of like that. And um, and as soon as the Third Reich started taking over, transsexuals who were not gay and were not Jewish were more than welcome to continue to uh, uh, engage in their transvestic fetishism. Um, and in fact, if you look at this over here, oh wait, not that one, different one. The idea of transvesticism or cross-dressing, uh, it was not a huge thing that the Nazis were, you know, super upset about, considering how many of them engaged in it. <laughs> and, you know, there's also, I don't, I don't believe this has been fully backed up with, with hard evidence. Um, so I will uh, preface this statement uh, with the caveat that I don't believe this has been fully confirmed. Um, but there's a belief that perhaps the Sex Institute was, perse- you know, was persecuted or, or burned down or attacked um, was because they had files on gay Nazis. You know, Hitler was gay. <laughs> uh, why are you gay? <laughs> you know, and uh, again, I don't know if that like, I don't know if you Google that if like the hard evidence is going to show up, but like it's been said many times by many people and whether or not that makes it true is neither here nor there. Uh, yeah, I, I believe I know that I won a trivia question uh, in a bar at pub trivia about Hitler because he had one testicle that the the question was something about like this guy had a te- one testicle who who am I talking about and it was Hitler and I was right and I find that interesting because one of the experiments that um that uh Hirschfeld and Garbant were uh conducting was uh implanting the testes of straight men into heterosexual or excuse me of uh, straight men into gay men uh, to cure them of their homosexuality. So, you know, Hitler having one testicle, interesting. Who knows? Who knows? Um, this is all to say that uh, Nazis didn't have a problem with cross-dressing and a lot of them were gay. So, you know, this whole idea that like Magnus Hirschfeld was specifically persecuted for his his 
uh, you know, pioneering of, of trans and gay shit uh, is kind of uh, ahistorical. Uh, so let's see, back to Donovan's piece. Donovan's a wonderful writer, by the way. Um, I, I really enjoy his work. You know, again, Magnus was a eugenicist. Um, in this segment, uh, uh, from the Jur Journal of American Medical uh, Association, Danish clinicians wrote in 1953, at any rate, from a eugenic point of view, it would do no harm if a number of sexually abnormal men were castrated and thus deprived of their sexual libido. Hmm. Hmm. Sounds extremely progressive. Very, very, uh, LGBTQ ally, uh, energy, you know? Uh, so this piece is really more just pointing out that um, transgender historians who love to retcon themselves into the past to make it seem like trans people have always existed mm -hmm. um, tend to just leave out the fact that Magnus Hirschfeld was a eugenicist <laughs> um, and he, uh, you know, was really into hiring future Nazi doctors to castrate gay guys and dudes with transvestic fetishistic tendencies. Um, so yeah, check that one out if you want. Also, that links to Fred Sargent's uh, piece on uh, the dark legacy of Magnus Hirschfeld. And he goes into, besides being a eugenicist who was into castrating gay guys, um, Hirschfeld uh, was also um, a traitor to other gay guys. I mean, Fred Sargent, you know, def definitely gives credit where credit is due in that, you know, Hirschfeld definitely was um, upset by this lecture on sexual degeneracy, which involved a gay man being paraded around before the lecture theater like a lab animal. Like, that's fucking terrible. Obviously, we shouldn't be doing that. You know, another reason that he's bolstered as a, you know, gay rights activist darling is because of his objective to remove paragraph 175, which criminalized gay sex um, from the German Imperial Code, which, hey, I agree with that. That's great. Um, I don't think homosexuality should be criminalized. So, you know, we can get on board with that. However, Sargent uh, does a good job of shedding light on the uh, Eulenburg affair, um, in which ended up being a, a huge scandal. Uh, so quick summary of the Eulenburg affair. A journalist, Maximilian Hardin, alleged that um, uh, Emperor Wilhelm II had fallen under the influence of a group of homosexuals led by Prince Philip Eulenburg. Um, turns out he'd been fed this story by a rival of the uh, emperor, uh, and it turned into a huge scandal. Um, and after Hardin broke the story, there were criminal proceedings. Uh, so somebody who got caught up in it was Kuno von Moltke, a uh, military commander. And Hardin had alleged that von Moltke had an affair with Eulenburg. And uh, that prompted von Moltke to take legal action. Libelous, I would as well. And so Hirschfeld testified uh, against von Moltke that he was a homosexual um, just based on the fact that he was kind of, you know, vagal. Uh, and uh, uh, <laughs> because his ex-wife was a stone-cold bitch, apparently. Um, so, and look at that. That's nice. He said it was unnecessary for von Moltke to actually have ever engaged in a homosexual act to be labeled one. So, um, turns out Hardin won in the first trial, von Moltke successfully pushed for a second, and then Hirschfeld reversed his original testimony and uh labeled his ex-wife as hysterical now that uh now that he didn't agree with her <laughs> you know her belief that her husband was fagula so uh it turns out it did a great deal of damage to his reputation great it should that's a bitch ass move the whole affair dogged him for the remainder of his life and yet today people who uh you know coin him this father of the gay liberation movement mention not an iota of it or if they do it is uh in a footnote uh and then of course now um sergeant moves on to how he was a eugenicist uh not just against gay men but also uh people with physical disabilities like uh people with dwarfism or mental health issues um, you know, so the, the best people should be mating with the best people. Very, uh, Margaret Sanger of Planned Parenthood 
same kind of same kind of ilk and it turns out that his kind of um and it comes up later in this article the eugenicist um ideas and policies that he champions were used in california and california has a huge history of forced sterilization um in which some of the victims of it are alive to this day and um i don't know if they've received if they've all received reparations or because i recent i read a substack article recently um that was talking about reparations for people who were sterilized uh in forcibly sterilized in california um when the the thing passed in san francisco was it san francisco or was it the whole fucking state we're basically we're just giving black people free money for reparations <laughs> even though california was never <laughs> literally never a slave state it's so crazy um and i believe the article was saying like why are you focusing on those kinds of reparations when there are you know millions of californians who were forcibly sterilized um and i believe also sergeant mentions later in the article that the eugenicist policies enacted in california acted as inspiration for eugenicist policies in nazi germany so you know again I don't think we should be valorizing this kind of guy. Um, his Institute for Sexual Research was opened in 1919, and he encouraged voluntary sterilization and castration for gay men. And he was open to forced sterilization of feeble-minded and oversexed and disabled people. So really cool guy, really, really great guy for Jews to be propping up as a, you know, just a bastion of progress. Um, and oh, look at that. He thought that gay guys, or homosexuality indicated a third sex, a, a third gender, because a woman's soul was trapped in a man's body. Same shit, different day. Here's this bloke. Look at that fucking bloke. I mean, really, the Danish girl, this motherfucker wishes. I, like, even in this grainy ass, this is like the opposite of Facetune, where like, it's so, um, it's so degraded in terms of like quality. You know, that it's like, <laughs> you know, that like maybe the photography is so bad, it like makes him look more, more female. It doesn't. This is still a bloke. I can see it. Look at that bloke chin. He's just like a, he's just a fucking man, you know? And you know what? He died of sepsis because he got fucking ovaries and a uterus transplanted into his body like a fucking idiot. And I don't feel bad for him at all. <laughs> like, sorry, bro, you're crazy. Congratulations, you played yourself. Oh, God. Oh, and he got vaginoplasty, like a vault. Yeah, and of course, it ended a disaster. Um, so, uh, turns out it didn't affect Hirschfeld or Gorbant's career. Gorbant, uh, continued to do sterilizations on people in a hospital in Berlin, became a high ranking Nazi official, lead pos position in the Luftwaffe. Um, and, uh, he continued to do human experiments on prisoners at Dachau. So really just, just awesome, awesome dude to, to surround yourself with, you know? Sergeant then details the, uh, sexology, you know, tour that I detailed earlier. Um, uh, and I guess, let's see. Oh, look at that. 64 year old Hirschfeld met and fell in love with 23 year old medical student Li Shu Tong. Uh, and Lee joined him on the world tour as a secretary, where they were fucking gay lovers together. And, you know, like, listen, it's kosher, you know, legally a 64 and a 23 year old, whatever. It's legal, consenting adults and all that. But like, man, that shit bothers me with pretty much any, it doesn't have to be gay or straight, you know, regardless of the orientation. Like that always is just like, oh man, like a 64 year old dude going after a 20 something, like gross, man, grow the fuck up. Oh, and, uh, and then Sargent does a really great deep dive on the, uh, subsequent, you know, book burning that happened at the sex Institute. A lot of people, um, trans, uh, and Jewish activists on the left, made this claim that um hirschfeld's institute was like the first book burning in germany it wasn't it wasn't they actually begun two months earlier and were conducted in three phases uh the first was aimed at communist socialist uh and uh jewish publishers and booksellers and uh to be clear 
the primary reason that Hitler uh, first started targeting communists is because he was at a bar one night and looked around and realized all the communists happened to be Jewish, which that probably wasn't even true, you know. Um, so, you know, Hitler's demonization of communism was even rooted in his hatred of Jews more than anything else. And um, communists are so fucking easy to go after because they're their whole ideology is ridiculous that then it becomes if it's palatable to go after these this political group that is literally helping the Weimar Republic crumble and just say I'm going after communists then it's easier to ah okay well now what I really meant by communists was Jews um so you know, let's also get that straight. Because a lot of times I will have tankies, which are like tankies, if you don't know that term, are like stands of Stalin, Mao, and Lenin. Um, and, um, you know, they always love to be like, oh, no, that the Holocaust wasn't about Jews. It was about communists and blee, blue blah. And it's like, homie, he went after communists because he believed them all to be Jewish. Um and, you know, Karl Marx was a Jew, in a, uh, ethnically, um, but he certainly was not a Jew who, who followed any kind of Jewish law. And that also gets thrown up against us is all the time as well. If it's not um, that, you know, Jews are the greedy capitalists and the Rothschilds and the bankers and all that shit and the Soroses of the world, then it's also, well, we're, the, we're at fault for communism, too. Like, we're the root of the problem of communism because Karl Marx was a Jew. And it's like, no... Karl, Karl Marx wasn't a communist because he was Jewish. He was a communist despite being Jewish. If he actually did anything that was remotely Jewish, he'd realize like what a fucking ridiculous thing it was that he was writing. Um, you know, but he was, um, he was a broke ass bitch who lived with his mom and, uh, <laughs> you know, basically, uh, was financed by, friends and family members uh, while he sat around and jerked off and wrote Capital and all of his other nonsense uh, instead of getting a real fucking job like the rest of us. <laughs> so anyways, that's, uh, again, they went for the communists and the Jews. Um, and then let's see, March 33 in Dresden, uh, Ernst Storm's stormtroopers broke into the publishing house of the Social, Ed Social Democratic Party newspaper. Uh, the second phase targeted libraries and institutions of learning. Uh, in early April 1933, the German Students' Union, dominated since 1931 by the National Socialist German Students' League, announced plans to cleanse libraries of un-German books and published materials. Uh, let's see. Nazi librarian Wolfgang Ehrmann produced a blacklist of uh, 310 titles uh, to be used by the Students' Union, and Hirschfeld's books were not on the list. So... Uh, they raided the Institute anyways, um, spontaneously grabbing the titles that they found there. And a third phase of book burning followed, which targeted smaller libraries and bookshops. Um, uh, there, like I mentioned uh, earlier, there was speculation that the students uh, were looking for ro records of Nazi officers who'd received treatment at the Institute. Um, although the Magnus Hirschfeld Society continues to dispute this rumor, either way, the Gestapo had visited the Institute several times, uh, only to, to discover that the Institute's director, Carl Giese, had already removed the most important personal records and sent them to Hirschfeld, who was then residing in Switzerland. So um, it really wasn't about a book burning, you know, and, um, and you know, even if it was, the motivation behind it was uh, because of Jew hatred. So, you know, and also the self-loathing homosexual aspect of Nazism in which they also have to persecute gays because they don't like looking in the mirror and seeing themselves staring back. <laughs> um, and let's see, he, he got to flee the Shoah. That's the other thing. Is that motherfucker got to go chill in Switzerland? Um, and then Paris, um, Oh, nice. Diabetic and obese, taking care of himself and all that stuff. Was resettled in a luxurious five bedroom apartment facing the sea in Nice. So he got to retire in France. 
Um, and he, he died of a stroke before, you know, Auschwitz was even a thought at that point. So, you know, he gets painted as like this victim of the Holocaust when in actuality, like he was like a crazed eugenicist who was castrating gay dudes and, um, you know, flitting around with a, uh, 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 you know, twink, I would have to imagine. <laughs> I don't know what his lover Lee looked like, but I'd have to imagine he's probably some kind of twink. Where? Where's the victimization? <laughs> Show me where he was persecuted. Because I don't, I don't really see that. Um, and, and Fred Sargent ends with, you know, saying his attempts to decriminalize homosexuality are admired, but... His belief in eugenics, flirtation with racial theory, and contribution to gender ideology are all deeply troubling. Um, the legacy he has left is far more ambiguous than his contemporary champions would have us to believe. Um, so, yeah, that's the tea on Magnus Hirschfeld. And this video has been going for a little bit longer than I anticipated, so I'm not going to be getting to um, the stuff about the six genders and excuse me it's six sex classes um listed in the talmud um nor would i was i able to get into sort of how we as jews rectify uh the passages from deuteronomy and leviticus um um outlawing or or um deeming homosexuality uh a an abomination um especially because like you know it, most people do not choose to be gay. Uh, so what do we do about that? You know, um, which and I totally would love to to dive deeper on that. But this has been going for almost an hour. I'm a lot more long winded than I mean to be always. I can't help it. I must speak. <laughs> but yeah, I hope that this has shed some light on who Magnus Hirschfeld really was. And um uh, maybe give people some resources uh, to dispel the the myth behind him. Because again, Magnus Hirschfeld is not somebody we should be um, glamorizing. I actually, I even started reading one of um, his books called uh, The Transvestites, The Urge to Cross-Dress. And so far, it's just reading like an AGP handbook. It's just AGP. So, you know, again, when, 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 trans activists want to go on about how like, oh, trans people have always existed. It's like, homie, paraphilias have always existed. That's the issue here, you know? And, um, and, and in the case studies that I've read so far, this like fixation on wanting to live life as a woman is so based in fantasy of what these men believe a woman's life to be like. That is something that was when the cognitive dissonance would hit the hardest for me when I was doing drag and had AGP friends who were in denial of their AGP or were peddling this idea that it was, a you know, that AGP had be, been debunked. They would always say like shit like, oh, I would love like I just I want to be a bimbo and like it must be nice to be able to to get whatever man you want. And it's like, I don't what are you talking about? <laughs> Like what, like they, these dudes like really think that like, I can just go out and, and bag the hottest dude I want just because I'm a woman. It's like, no, you know, the, the odds are good, but the goods are odd, sir. I could go out and get laid if I wanted to, but chances are like, it's not going to be a quality man. You know, if, if it's a dude who's just looking for a one night stand, like that's not a quality man to me. So so, you know, and it, it also just ignores the way that like the, the, uh, the sort of the human mating ritual has, uh, evolved, um, you know, both biologically and, and, and psychologically women have the bigger burden. They are the, the risk of having sex, uh, for women is, is so much greater because we're the ones who get pregnant and have to carry a child for nine months. Um, so, you know, 
we we've evolved to be selective for a reason going out and and getting into like a bukkake gangbang as fun as that might seem to some you know extremely like fucked up people regardless of how fun that sounds it doesn't eliminate the risk nor does it uh tamper the biological uh a drive to be selective as women in who we allow into our bedrooms I don't know if I have anything else to say other than, um, fuck Magnus Hirschfeld <laughs> and, and fuck everybody who's rewritten Jewish history, especially, especially the Goyim. I've studied a lot of Jewish history and there can be a tendency, uh, to want to appease the, the majority ruling class in some way, uh, in order to be free from prosecution. Uh, and I totally understand that. So when I see Jews kind of doing the rosy eyed view of Magnus Hirschfeld, you know, rewriting of history, I, I can, I'm more forgiving of that one, because I believe in Ahavat Yisrael, which is love for your fellow Jew. Um, and I consider it a transgression, but I would be more willing to forgive that um to well-meaning but misguided jews who are just trying to like fit in or whatever than i am with people who are non-jews <laughs> purposely taking our history rewriting it and then giving it as ammunition to other people to continue to hurt us persecute us, pogrom us. You know, I see Jews getting blamed for transgenderism, feminism, homosexuality. We get blamed for everything. That's just how it goes. Um, so the people that I'm really most angry at are the, the uh, Goisha historians and activists who have um, um, perverted our, our history um, to suit their needs. You know, I, I can't stand the lying. I can't stand the retconning. And um, and ultimately, the people who suffer most with this kind of historical revisionism are Jews when it comes to, to this kind of thing. Rewriting Jewish history to fit some sort of progressive leftist communist utopia narrative hurts Jews more than anybody else. It's, it's a Shanda to do that, to rob us of, of the truth of our history. I've gotten in, in Twitter spats with fellow Jews who are, you know, super on board for gender affirming care. And then they throw Magnus Hirschfeld in my face. And I'm like, that fucking guy? You believe that guy, homie? But they do. And then the, the references that they pull up are, are primarily from, from Gentiles um, who've basically inserted their ideology into into history to rob it of its truth and to politicize it and to weaponize it and in the blowback it comes down on us there's not that many of us in the world people for, <laughs> feel like people think there's so many more jews than there actually are make a point two percent of the world population 15 point something million jews in the entire world so I'm more willing to believe my own eyes, ears, and brain, critical thinking skills, all of that shit, than trust some fucking queer academic who, you know, is licking Judith Butler's asshole all day saying that, oh, well, you know, Magnus Hirschfeld, like, no, fuck you, dog, fuck you, not on my fucking watch. I'll do another one of these. Uh, uh, I'll get into sort of like, how do we rectify halacha, which is Jewish law? How do we rectify halacha surrounding LGB? Um, and how do we divorce that from the TQ madness? Whatever, I'm tired of this shit. <laughs> it's the long end of it. So I'm, I'm gonna go to bed. Continue to stay stunning and brave. That's all I can say at this point.